creeping and crawling in their hidden dens. The Avalachia are unknown to most of the world. However, unlike most disgusting creatures which combine the worst elements of an octopus, a worm, and many different types of insects, the Avalachia are no mere mindless creatures. In fact, they would consider the association with carrion crawlers or any other vile worm that crawls along the ground to be quite beneath them. These creatures are intelligent, organized, they have their own society, and they seek to bring about the ruin of ours. So join me today as we discuss one of the main proponents of the Age of Worms. And we're going to talk about how you can use them to make your players have horrible nightmares. Hello and welcome to Monster of the Week, the show where we dig up old creatures from past editions of D&D and bring them to light for use in your current 5th edition game. My name is Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and as always, if you want to follow along with this video or you're just curious to see it, the stat block for this monster can be found in the description below. And then of course would be the 5th edition stat block, not the version from... 3.5. So today we're talking about a monster that if you have heard of it before, you most likely have pretty horrific memories from the 3.5 days of D&D revolving around it. The Evolachia is this aberrant, horrifying, slime-covered worm with many eye stalks that hang off the side of it like tentacles and all these tiny sharp little claws, and of course a very interesting face with a mouth completely lined with serrated teeth pronged with three sharp hooks. This is one of those creatures that makes me so glad we have incredibly talented artists that work for Wizards or any of the other RPG companies out there because trying to visualize this thing based on the description is just not easy. But when you look at the image of this monster, you get it. You understand what an Avalachia is supposed to be and it's not good. These things are downright horrific and absolutely look like some kind of foul demon spawn or something like that that you might run into in the Underdark. And while you could encounter them there, the actuality of the situation is that they're no mere mindless killing machines. In this piece of artwork particularly, that is kind of suggested by the fact that it seems to be wearing some sweet bling and it has like a sacrificial dagger. Because bumping into this thing is... Totally fine, but watch out if he pulls out his dagger, you don't want anyone to get hurt. Now what makes these creatures so terrifying is not just the fact that they're organized, but the fact that they are shape changers and they can change into any humanoid form they desire. And on top of that, it's how they use that shape changing ability to infiltrate societies and ultimately build up their cult to the undead god Kyus. But I am getting ahead of myself here. Today, as always, we're going to talk about just exactly what these monsters can do in combat, and then we're going to get into some plot hooks and some kind of backstory about just what these creatures are and why you should absolutely have a cult of them in your 5th edition game. But first things first, it is time to talk about... So as followers of the worm that walks, the notorious undead god Kyus, they have, of course, powers that not only reflect some of the abilities that certain undead get, but that also give them sway over the undead, because these guys are straight up necromancers. Their biggest strength comes from the fact that they can use their shape-changing ability to turn into any humanoid form and kind of lure those people away, maybe back to where they have their cult established, and then either sacrifice them or kill them in some way and turn them into an undead servant. They do this, of course, by casting spells like create undead, animate dead, that sort of thing. And as far as actually convincing people to come back to their lair, because even if someone is talking to you and they're very charming, but it's just some random person you've only known for a short time, you might be hesitant to follow them to a place that you might consider to be dangerous. These guys have an ability just built in where if they talk to another humanoid creature when they're in a humanoid form, and they do so with a very soothing and kind of lulling voice, they get to essentially cast suggestion on that person, which allows them to suggest a course of action that that target must then do. Now, of course, if you're familiar with suggestion, you know it won't allow them to command someone to jump off a cliff or something like that, but they could say, hey, just follow me for a minute, and that would seem like a great idea to that person. Now, the only thing is here, they're not actually casting a spell, it just creates the same effect as a suggestion spell. So that effect cannot be counterspelled, and it also won't register as I'm using magic if you were to have someone who, say, had detect magic up. 
they're merely blessed with that manipulative aspect of Kyos and it allows them to kind of manipulate the masses essentially. So when it comes to actually doing battle, their biggest strength isn't really in the heat of the moment, it's in preparation. They're very smart, very wise, and they will almost always have their undead servants with them if they think there's even a chance that a fight will break out. So their whole strategy is to get their undead minions between whoever's attacking them and themselves so that their minions are kind of doing some damage and basically soaking up any damage that would be coming their way while they stay at the back and cast spells. And they can be casting spells that are creating more minions or casting some minor spells like Chill Touch, that kind of thing that are causing a bit of damage. And of course they do have a couple really big spells that they can only use once or twice a day like Contagion or Enervation. But if something does get up close and personal with them, which is bound to happen, they have two major tools that they use to prevent that from happening. The first of which is the fact that these creatures have a kind of regenerative capability. Not quite as strong as, say, a troll, but these creatures do regenerate a few hit points at the beginning of each of their turn unless they take some acid damage. And if they do get attacked with acid or even lightning, it will stop the regeneration from taking effect. And also, unlike a troll, if they reach zero hit points, they do simply die. They don't continue to regenerate even once they're killed. The other major tool in their arsenal is a bite attack, which causes a pretty okay amount of damage considering how high their threat rating is. But the biggest thing here is that this attack causes wisdom drain, potentially. All of those serrated teeth in that disgusting maw of theirs are coated with a wisdom draining poison. And if your wisdom is reduced to zero, you essentially collapse. You are just incapacitated, not really able to do anything. So it won't outright kill somebody, but it will essentially prevent them from fighting back and eliminating someone from a battle that way can be devastating for the other side. This also means after a battle, any survivors who are just incapacitated can absolutely be taken as prisoners and eventually turned into more undead. So needless to say, at close range or from afar especially, these guys are no joke. When you couple that with the fact that they are definitely bound to have a scheme for almost any situation, they can be a serious threat and serve either as a very powerful minion to an even more powerful overlord or to kind of a potential overlord role themselves. So on that note, let's take a look at some of the roles we could put these guys in and talk about so as I mentioned, these creatures, at least in the stock lore that we have, primarily serve the god Kyus. In fact, they first premiered in the Age of Worms adventures, which were essentially a series of adventures all about the undead god Kyus trying to return to the material plane, and one facet of that was this cult of Avalachia that was essentially trying to herald his return. If you've never played Age of Worms, or maybe you've heard of it but you've never actually checked it out, I would absolutely recommend looking into it because it's a really interesting adventure setting. But all that aside, that is what these creatures are meant to do. They use their shape-changing ability to infiltrate society and often will try to kind of get involved or worm their way in, if you will, to the religious orders of a civilization. And from there, they can either find people who are easily corruptible and kind of get them involved with joining the cult of worshipping the god Kyus. Perhaps they find someone who lost a family member that was dear to them and they promise them a way of bringing that person back to life if only they follow their way and worship this other god. Because bringing someone back to life is absolutely within the power of a god of undeath. You just might not like the way that they return to the world. And of course they use this ability to also eliminate anyone who might be a threat to them by luring them away back to the cult and murdering them and turning them into undead. And if possible they will try to get themselves in a leadership role, literally leading churches to other gods with the end goal of slowly twisting that god's teachings and corrupting it to have those people eventually worshipping the god of undeath. You can also make kind of a more variant or more powerful version of the Avalachia who perhaps has a few extra spells and is kind of a senior cleric of their cult, or maybe he's been blessed directly by the undead god Kyus. And in that sort of event, they could take maybe nobles or other people in places of authority from within the city, kidnap them, and turn them into vampires that are bound to their will, who will then kind of run things from a political standpoint. I mean, in terms of DMing for a party, maybe the party meets one of these thralls that is an undead creature that is able to hide its undead nature, such as a vampire, and that creature then tasks them with eliminating these Avalachian worms 
because they're afraid that the party's going to cause them trouble and instead send them into an ambush where they're attacked by all these undead forces, of course the Avalachia being ready for them. And on a different note, something else I find really fascinating about these creatures is their diet. See, they eat primarily undead flesh. So they could eat not undead meat or some type of vegetables or fruits or really anything else. They would just really rather not to. Like if they were starving to death, they would eat a pork chop or something. But given the choice, they will always eat undead meat. And that's their primary means of keeping themselves alive. So I just like the idea of them kind of having huge stocks of like undead cows or something like animals that would serve no purpose in combat other than the fact that they can literally use that maybe as a beast of burden that also operates as a mobile larder. Like they have some kind of massive carrion beetle from the Underdark or something. They're just slicing off flanks of beetle flesh as they go along. That's more of a fluff detail, but I feel like it gives them a lot of character and is just kind of unique and interesting. And it's for this reason, I imagine when they reproduce, they probably lay their eggs in some sort of undead creature. And that creature carries them around until it births all these tiny little worms or something extremely horrific to that end. It just kind of opens up a lot of really interesting questions about their society, which is cool. It's because it's very rare that we get a creature in D&D who has a functioning society and all these kind of rules and rituals and religions that isn't a form of humanoid. Like these creatures are meant to be very unrelatable. In fact, when they speak to one another, they can speak several different languages in their humanoid form. And they also have the ability to cast tongues on themselves. But when they're in their true form of just this worm tentacle creature, they don't actually have the capacity to speak other languages. They have their own kind of guttural language that would sound like nothing to most other people. But in that form, they can't speak common. They would have to turn into some type of humanoid in order to speak with someone else. Now that doesn't mean they don't understand it. They can cast tongues on themselves and still understand every language. Or if someone happens to be speaking common to one of them and they just speak common, They'll still understand what you're saying, they just won't be able to talk back without transforming into something that actually has the vocal apparatus to do so. And of course, if you just like these creatures as kind of a different spin on doppelgangers, but you don't really like the lore and kind of cultish stuff that's attached to them and you have a different idea for how to use them, absolutely go for it. I mean, they're definitely set up to be cultists that follow the undead god, but you don't have to have them necessarily worshiping a god. Maybe they're just doing this to take over society. Perhaps instead of trying to bring about the age of worms and cause a plague of undeath upon the entire material plane, they're simply seeking to subjugate and rule whatever living creatures are on the material plane. Whether that means turning them all into undead or getting them all under their thrall to the point where you don't know who is an Avalachia and who isn't. Maybe your neighbor is, maybe they weren't, but then they were taken and turned into an undead minion and replaced by an Avalachia. You have no idea. And that kind of set of paranoia, body snatchers type situation could be a really interesting setting to play a game either where the characters are trying to take down the Avalachia, or maybe it's just a completely different story, but that happens to be the backdrop. Anytime where you have this kind of air of paranoia and not really knowing for certain who's who or that anyone's still who they said they are or might have once been, it can cause a lot of really interesting situations. And if your D&D parties are anything like mine, it's only a matter of time before they'll start turning on each other. In any case, that's pretty much all I have to say about these creatures. I think they're really fascinating. I think they're really unique. They bring a lot to the table we don't get from a lot of other D&D monsters. And whether you were planning on having a cult to an undead god, or you just think you might have a place for fit these guys in as kind of an extra element to a grand city, I think the Avalachia are just really awesome creatures. And again, it's just another stat block I'm happy to have in my monster manual. And as I mentioned before, if you do want to run these guys in combat or use them in your game, you can find the stat block in the form of a Google document in the description underneath this video, which has everything you need right there. And as always, if you are one of my lovely patrons, you can get the kind of monster manual style stat block posted on the Patreon page. And if you do like what I do here and you want to see me keep on making videos, if you are not one of my patrons and you are thinking about becoming one, definitely check that out. It helps me out more than I can even explain. But in any case, I do just want to say thank you guys so much for watching. If you have a suggestion for a monster you'd like to see covered in the future and converted, please leave a comment or get at me on Discord or Twitter, whatever, and perhaps you'll see it in a video someday. 
In any case, thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate it, and I will see you in the next video. Till then. One can sometimes find clarity in madness, but only rarely.